Right, in this um, tutorial, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the motor pathway, but we're going to do it in an interesting way, because what I've got is I've got um, a data set which uses diffusion tensor imaging to show the various white matter tracts. So I'm going to talk you through the motor pathways and we're going to look at some relevant bits and pieces by using this beautiful data set. Now what we're looking at at the moment, um, on the right hand side I've got a series of sections. So I've got um, the transverse plane, the coronal plane in green there, and at the bottom in yellow the sagittal plane. And what the software has been able to do is to put these together in order to produce this beautiful volume of the brain. So this is a rendering of the brain um, by combining these images in the data set. Now this is from um, the T1 MRI study. Um, but one thing that you might have noticed is that the images are a little bit fuzzy. And the reason that they are slightly fuzzy is because actually this data set is from 100 individuals. So this is something that we rarely see in anatomy. We're used to seeing single individuals uh, and only getting an appreciation for variation by looking at many individual specimens. However, what this is, is this is, what, if you like, statistical anatomy. This is 100 scans which have been averaged together. And that's why we've got a very slight fuzziness in the data set. Now looking at the rendering on the left hand side and um, we can see our um, relevant anatomy we can see the frontal lobe here, the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe at the back and the parietal lobe. We can see the cerebellum here and if I rotate it around we can see the brain stem and the three major divisions the midbrain, pons and medulla. If I go back to the uh, left hand view, um, despite the variation between individual brains, it's quite remarkable that we can actually pretty much make out the central sulcus. So if I change the view ever so slightly, the central sulcus, to my mind, is quite clearly delineated here. So this is the position of the central sulcus, and what we have here is the precentral gyrus and the post-central gyrus. And I tend to think of the pre- and the post-central gyruses as a bit like two irregular sausages running parallel to one another, with the central sulcus being the groove in between those two irregular sausages. Let me prove to you further that this rendering is derived from these cross-sections. If we look at an inferior view of the brain, and I just tilt it a little bit so that I can see the uh, midbrain a little more clearly. Um, if I just change um, my tool settings, so if I bring up um, a 3D brush in effect, the yellow circle, the position of the yellow circle on the top right red image um, corresponds to the grey sphere in the 3D reconstruction. So just look at where the yellow circle is and correlate that with the position of the grey sphere on the left. And also you should be able to see further yellow circles appearing on the relevant planes in the other views. So the first thing that I'm going to do is you can see in the red image on the top right um, we have the typical appearance of the midbrain. This Mickey Mouse shaped structure with those two big ears and if I put my pointer on one of the ears of Mickey Mouse just here um, I'm on the right cerebral peduncle and here I'm on the left cerebral peduncle and if you look um, at the mid sagittal view at the bottom you can see that the yellow circle in the mid sagittal view at the bottom sitting at the level of the midbrain. If I move down through the slices we get to the very prominent bulge of the pons. So there on the top right hand view you can see that I'm just sitting on the anterior surface of the pons which is clear um, in the 3D rendering and furthermore on the sagittal section at the bottom right you can see I'm at the pons there. Scrolling further down we get to the very prominent um, 
medulla and the key feature of the medulla is the two pyramids which you can see in the image at the top right we've got the two pyramids bulging out anteriorly and I'm just showing you the position of the left pyramid and the right pyramid here and in fact in the midline you can see the tiny tiny yellow circle corresponding to the rostral medulla in the mid sagittal view so that's just to convince you really that um, the three-dimensional rendering um, has been derived from these cross sections and as I said it's an average it's derived from a hundred individual brains in living people now that's just to give us the basic anatomical landmarks let's now um, try and put on some white matter and with MRI you can do some very very clever things you can essentially follow the diffusion of water through the brain and water will tend to diffuse by capillary action along axons and particularly along bundles of axons so what we are able to do is we're able to use a particular scanning protocol to follow the diffusion of water and what people have already done is they've actually separated out the various pathways and as I said I'm focusing just on the motor pathway on the corticospinal tract so let's now um, focus in and take a look at what the corticospinal tract looks like and the first thing that I'm going to do is actually superimpose the um, white matter pathways on this rendering of the brain so we've already defined the central sulcus um, and if I just get rid of the uh, white matter we said didn't we that the central sulcus is approximately here so if I bring back the white matter pathways we can see that they are sitting around the central sulcus this these neurons forming the origin of the corticospinal tract are sitting around the central sulcus now I don't need to get worried um, about the fact that many of these neurons are actually coming from the post central gyrus in fact the corticospinal tract does have an important role in the regulation of the sensory system but really we can discount that we can ignore that and just make the assumption that all of these fibers being shown here are from the precentral gyrus from the motor cortex now there is a color scheme that has been applied to this reconstruction and we can see that the lateral most regions here that is the parts corresponding to the face in the motor homunculus are colored red and we can see that the medial most portions i.e. those corresponding to the lower limb are colored in this pale blue and that the trunk is colored in yellow and we're going to be looking at the um, projections from the face regions compared to the lower limb regions slightly later on so the next stage the next thing I want to do um, is actually to get rid of the 3d rendering and just look at the diffusion data set on its own so let's get rid of the uh, 3d rendering if I can just change my settings so now I've gotten rid of the 3D rendering and I'm showing you the diffusion data set specifically looking at the corticospinal pathway. And, and, and if you think anything like me, you'll think that this is incredibly beautiful. You know, I love looking at these things and, and I think they're absolutely fantastic. Once again, we can see the um, red fibers from the face, the yellow fibers from the trunk, and the blue fibers from the lower limb but furthermore we can see that these fibers are coalescing together in the corona radiata so we can see the formation of the corona radiata here and that there is further coalescence to form the internal capsules and then the um, cerebral peduncles going down into the midbrain when we go through the ponds and the medulla we can see that there's a whole load of things happening and in fact we know that there is decussation occurring down here in the caudal medulla but really that we can't see that just because of the sheer density of fibers that have been mapped in this study so what I want to do now <clears throat> 
is just to once again correlate these cross sections from the MRI with the diffusion data set. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to place on the transverse section onto the diffusion data set just like this. So now what we can do is we can see um, the diffusion data set and if I'm if I just reorientate myself ever so slightly we can see the diffusion data with the corresponding transverse section and if I scroll through the transverse sections I can go through the various levels with the two superimposed so let's take a closer look at this so let's start right up at the top here um, I'm not going to talk about you know the cortex we, um, we can't really see the cortex very, very easily. Um, however, we can start to see this corona radiata. So let's bring on um, a tool to just demonstrate that to you. Um, so here is the corona radiata, as we've said. And we can see the corona radiata as this region of white matter here. Okay, And remember that the corona radiata... Um, looking at the transverse section top right, the corona radiata is the point at which all of these um, fibers from the primary motor cortex are starting to converge together. So you can see my cursor, the yellow circle, is in the corona radiata on the top right. And you can see also that it is corresponding to the 3D image on the left-hand side. So my circle here is particularly in the anterior region, the anterior most extent of the corticospinal pathway running within the corona radiata. All right. Now if we start to travel down through the sections, we can start to see that the corona radiata is in fact starting to condense down to get denser and denser and it is starting to form the internal capsule all right so here still which still it's corona radiata but we're starting to condense down now into this very narrow densely packed region the internal capsule continuing to move down we can see the internal capsule now becoming very nicely defined okay remember that in the transverse plane the internal capsule is v-shaped um, looking at the top right hand section we have our anterior limb we have our posterior limb and the bend is the genu okay now you should recall from the lectures that the anterior limb actually has relatively little to do with the corticospinal pathway. And you can see that, can't you? Because when you look at the 3D view, you can see that there are no fibers that have been labeled um, in the corticospinal tract running through the anterior limb. In fact, the anterior limb is most important for communication between the premotor areas and the cerebellum. If I zoom in a little bit onto the transverse section, um, we get a slightly better appreciation of the internal capsule. And if I place my cursor roughly here at the genu, can you see that that is in the region occupied by those red fibers? And remember that we said that the red fibers are the fibers that come from the parts of the motor cortex supplying the face. And this is a proof, if you like, that the genu contains facial axons axons destined to supply the face all right so here we can see we're at the genu there the tip of the v in the transverse section and that corresponds very very nicely to those red fibers within the, the uh, dti reconstruction and as i progress through in the posterior direction let me just zoom in a little bit on this as i progress in the posterior direction you can see sorry you can see that those fibers then correspond more to the uh, trunk and the lower limb. So we can see then the, the genu of the internal capsule with the red fibers and the subsequently lower portions of the body represented in the more posterior regions of the internal capsule. Now let's move our section further down until we get to the level here with our very familiar Mickey Mouse shape. All right. And you can see here that the ear of Mickey Mouse is the cerebral peduncle. And this corresponds with um, the fibers visible on the left-hand side where the gray sphere is. 
So here we're looking at the level of the cerebral peduncle where the internal capsule has condensed down even further um, and it's going into the brainstem now and forming the corticospinal tract. Let me zoom out ever so slightly uh, and now let's continue to move down through the sections and now we can appreciate that the corticospinal pathway is running through the pons so you can see um, the, the corticospinal pathway running through the anterior pons. However, what I want to point out is that there's a little bit of noise at this level, a little bit of distracting uh, data, because we can start to see, in fact, we've got these crossing fibers um, which are crossing over to the contralateral cerebellum. So it's harder to see the corticospinal pathways in the pons, uh, but they are there. And then finally, we move down now to the um, medulla and we can now just try I can just try to show you um, the fibers running through the ventral medulla within the pyramids so I've shown you there the um, corticospinal pathway moving down through the brain towards the spinal cord with the caveat that due to the density of fibers it's actually very very difficult to see the decussation the final thing I want to do is I just want to clean this up a little bit for you and I just want to show you the red fibers from the facial areas of the motor cortex and the blue fibers from the um, lower limb regions. So we just need to select a few areas. So I'm going to keep the blue regions to represent the lower limbs and I'm going to keep the red region to represent the face. In fact, I want to keep that and get rid of that. Right, so here, very, very nicely, beautifully, in fact, we can see how the motor system is partitioned in a topographic or somatotopic organization. I'm just um, altering the settings with the slices here because I just want to show you um, the internal capsule in a little bit more detail. So the blue fibers are from uh, supplying the lower limb, the red fibers are supplying the face and also a little bit of the upper limb. Now let us zoom in a little bit here and also let us zoom in on the transverse section at the top right hand side of the screen. Now as we've said a number of times and as you will have read the accepted dogma is that um, at the genu of the internal capsule we have fibers supplying the face and then the rest of the body is supplied at more posterior levels. However, what I want you to look at and what I want you to appreciate here is that there is a huge amount of mixing going on. Yes, if we're looking at the 3D view we can see at the genu at this point here it is primarily facial fibers. However, uh, however, as we move through the posterior limb of the internal capsule, what we really can see is that there is a lot of mixing between the blue lower limb fibers and the red face and upper limb fibers. And this explains something very important and something that can be a little bit puzzling about lacuna strokes. In lacuna infarcts, um, we tend to say that the face, the upper limb and the lower limb are all affected equally. And this is very difficult to um, square with the idea of somatotopic organization in the internal capsule. However, if we appreciate using data like this that these fibers are mixed together far more than the textbooks suggest, we can then appreciate that an infarct, say at this point, could affect the face, the trunk and the, upper, and, and the lower limb equally since those fibers all mix together. So I hope that this has been um, useful and informative for you. Um, I think that these DTI data sets are absolutely beautiful and really awe-inspiring to look at. Um, the software I've used is, is completely free and if you've got a PC or a Mac you can download this and you can get hold of all this data to play about with yourself. Uh, so thanks for listening.